first reading is from Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 to 25. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Now, when Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. And then we continue in Luke chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. Here ends the lessons. Thank you for that really fine scripture reading. Expressive. You've got some talented folks here. You do a good job. It's nice to be back with you. I'm getting in the habit. It's almost feels like I'm a regular here. And uh, yeah, well, I. Even though I have to divide my time between here and there, I'm still family, so I, I, I claim those, uh, well, whatever they are, privileges, rights, I don't know, none of that, but hey, this is Christmas season, are you all aware of that? Yeah. <laughs> How can we not be? And we love it. It's, uh, it is, in a way, uh, the most wonderful time of the year. I understand that uh, the last couple of Sundays, you've been looking at the prophecies that lead up to the birth of Christ and what was said about his coming in the Old Testament. And uh, so on the heels of that, I want to ask this question, uh, because we're right in the middle of all the decorations and the holiday activities, and most of us are busier than usual because of Christmas activities taking place. What, why? What's so special about Christmas? The Christmas holiday, there are a number of Christian holidays over the years. Uh, I'm sorry, over the year, over the church year, but nothing captivates our minds and hearts like Christmas. In fact, it's captivated the whole world. And of course we see all the excessive commercialism driven by Christmas, and, and that's unfortunate. Uh, but it's not entirely bad. It's come about because Christmas is a big deal. While Resurrection Sunday, Easter, is the most triumphant of most Christian holidays, of all the Christian holidays, Christmas is the most prominent of all, and it has been for centuries. Perhaps that is because at Christmas we celebrate the whole of Christ's saving ministry. Do you ever think about that? At Christmas time, we don't really just celebrate the nativity, although you have nativity scenes and creches everywhere. 
and that's part of our Christmas decoration, we really don't just celebrate the nativity. We celebrate the whole of Christ's saving ministry. Let's take a look at that this morning. What are we actually celebrating at Christmas? Well, first of all, and of course, we're celebrating Advent. Now, the word Advent just comes across from the Latin Adventus. Same word. We English folks just shorten it up a little bit. And it means coming or arrival. Just means what it is. The coming of Christ. The arrival of Christ on this earth to become one of us. The idea that he, the eternally pre-existent second person of the Godhead, came to rescue us from our sin and its consequences, is the manifestation that is the observable display of God's love for us. Just the idea that he came is a big deal. Like the Christmas hymn, you left your throne and your kingly crown when you came to the earth for me. And then it goes on, of course, in Bethlehem's home, there was found no room for your holy nativity. And then the chorus says, oh, come to my heart, Lord Jesus. But it starts out with that idea, you came and in his coming, he not only came from a different dimension, wherever heaven is, a different place, wherever heaven is, to this earth. He not only came a long way, he not only came to completely change his being, he actually crossed the line and became one of us. Fully God and fully man, in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. I can't get my brain around that. I'm awed by it every time I mention it or think about it, that he became one of us. And there is nowhere in Scripture, nowhere ever in Scripture where you even get a hint that he's ever going to lay that aside. He became one of us forever so we could be one with him forever. That's awesome. Of course, that's what we celebrate at Christmas. <clears throat> A young couple got married young. He was the football star of the high school football team. She was homecoming queen. They were in love, and they got married. And then reality set in. And one day she found herself over a whole stack of dirty dishes with crying babies tugging at her skirts, and she panicked, and she ran away. She just disappeared. The young husband was frantic, and he, the only thing he knew how to do was hire a private detective with what little money he could scrape together to try to find her. Well, they did find her. She was in a cheap hotel, of all places, in Des Moines, Iowa, which to some people is the end of the world, you know, <laughs> nowheresville. Anyway... You can imagine, while she was in that room, she's hopeless, she's filled with despair, she questions her actions, and is in, in great consternation, and then the knock comes at the door, and she flings open the door, and there she is, and she flies into his arms, and there's this tearful reunion, and she says, I was so afraid, so alone, felt so hopeless, and then you came. Ah. Long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. He came to rescue us from our sin and our separation from our Creator. 
we celebrate his coming. Also, we celebrate the virgin birth. Now, one of the points that I'm going to make with this material is to illustrate or validate my claim that Christmas celebrates all of the saving ministry of Christ. One point I'm going to make is through the Christmas carols that we sing. Almost all of the Christmas carols that we sing, saving the ones about wintertime and Santa Claus, which the world likes to promote, but those of us that love Jesus, we have this whole volume of Christmas hymns, and all of them, almost all of them, celebrate the, the, the virgin birth. But in celebrating the virgin birth, we celebrate Christ's divinity and his sinless life and the knowledge that he is literally Emmanuel. Not just a name, a word, but he is literally Emmanuel, God with us. The virgin birth makes it possible for him to be both God, fully God, and man, fully man. That's called the hypostatic union. You don't need to remember that. But that is a very, a very unique kind of union, God and man together in one, and neither are compromised fully God and fully man. And that's brought about by the virgin birth because he is biologically as well as poetically the son of God and the son of man. Did you know, you know, you, I've said this before, but looking for, crisp, uh, for sermon illustrations, you come up with the wackiest stuff it's hard to imagine anyone making a serious claim of virgin conception. Right? Wrong. Did you know, I didn't, that nearly 1% of pregnant women in the U.S. claim to have conceived as virgins? Researchers at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, this was in 1913, analyzed data from thousands of young women over the course of a decade and a half. That's 15 years. That's a pretty long study. And found that nearly one in a hundred, that's almost one percent, claimed to have conceived without ever being with the opposite sex. For opposite reasons, the study excluded those conceptions attributed to in vitro fertilization and so forth, things like that. The researchers tell us that such things as fallible memory, huh? <laughs> Delusion, that's more like it. Denial and wishful thinking can all cause people to err in what they tell scientists. Not to mention outright deception. It appears that Joseph wasn't the only one who had to weigh the claims of a pregnant virgin. That was weird. You can't blame Joseph for trying to think of the most honorable thing to do. And it's a good thing that he believed his dream, that the dream was vivid enough that he actually understood this was the angel of the Lord saying, whoa, Joseph, this really is a virgin conception. This is from God. Well, today, when we hear things like what I just read, we just snort at it. It's just not possible. So the virgin birth is a special deal. It was caused by God who created the heavens and the earth. And he created this situation so his son would be his son. And he would be the sinless 
Savior of the world so that our believing in the deity of Christ has solid scientific basis. So at the, at the time that we celebrate Christmas, we're celebrating the virgin birth. When we celebrate Christmas, we're also celebrating his sacrificial atonement and his resurrection. This is the purpose for which he came. We just sang it. The babe in the manger was born for sacrifice. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, second half of the verse, for this purpose was the Son of God manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. And there was only one way to do that, through the death and sacrifice of an innocent in our behalf. As Mary and Joseph headed for Bethlehem, Jesus was headed for the cross. That's why he came, and that's where he was headed. When you take, for instance, the carol, We Three Kings of Orient Are, if you pay attention, to, you know, we're used to singing just the first verses, but if you pay attention to the verses, you have a verse about gold He's a king about frankincense, that's his deity, about myrrh, that's his sacrifice. And then there's a last verse that says, glorious now, behold him arise, king and God and sacrifice. Heaven sings, hallelujah, hallelujah, earth replies. Why? Because he's risen. At Christmas time, we don't just celebrate his nativity. We celebrate his atonement and his victory over death and hell and the grave. Our Christmas hymns are literally filled with the atonement, the new birth, the resurrection. I would encourage you to get out a hymn book or just from memory, Go over some of the additional verses to the best-loved Christmas songs that you like to sing and notice, wow, this isn't just about the nativity. This is about all of it. We do indeed at this Christmas time celebrate all that Jesus did for us. And then let's not, oh, I got to tell you this. This is cute. In the, episode, in the episode of the comic strip Peanuts, we all love Peanuts, right? Cra Charlie Brown cracks open his piggy bank, and he says to Lucy, look, I got $9.11 to spend on Christmas gifts. And Lucy is not impressed. She never is. And he says, you can't buy something for everyone with $9.11, Charlie Brown. Charlie Brown says, oh, yeah, well, I'm going to try. Lucy says, they're sure going to be cheap presents. And Charlie says with absolute conviction, as only Charlie Brown can, nothing's cheap if it costs all you have. Ooh, that's heavy. When Jesus came, he gave all that he had. He did not consider his divinity, his position in heaven, something to be grasped, clung to, hung on to, Philippians chapter 2. But he came and was found in the form of a man, fully God and fully man. And then he became obedient to death, but not just death, the death of the cross with all of its shame and all of its gore and all of its agony. Wherefore, God has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. So when we sing Gloria in excelsis Deo, it's appropriate to sing Gloria and bring glory to Jesus, who became one of us so we could be forever with him. But you see, the Christmas story doesn't end there. 
There's a resurrection, and because he's risen, we're also celebrating his second advent, his return, and his eternal reign. Isaiah 9, 6 and 7, Zechariah 14, 9 and 16 to 21. I'll refrain from reading through all those verses, but they're really appropriate even at this time of the year. Zechariah 14, 9 says, And the Lord will be king over all the earth. On that day the Lord will be one and his name one. This is as much a part of the story as we celebrate, that we celebrate as that uh, as anything which has taken place in history and that which we are living in the present. This is the part of the story we're yet anticipating, looking forward to. A couple of the carols that you know by heart. Saints before the altar bending, watching long in hope and fear. Suddenly the Lord descending in his temple shall appear. That's not the nativity. That's his second coming. And that's a Christmas carol. For lo, the days are hastening on by prophet bards foretold. Refer to what you've heard the last couple of weeks. When with the ever circling years come round, comes round the age of gold. What's that? Well, that's the reign of Christ. Whatever you've been taught about the millennium or the millennial reign, Jesus is going to reign on the earth. It's been told to us by the prophets, the same prophets that prophesied his first coming. When peace shall over all the earth its ancient splendors fling. Yes, that day is coming. Isn't here yet. We're still anticipating, but that day is coming. No more let sins and sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow far as the curse is found. That hasn't happened yet. That's not the nativity. Listen to the rest. He rules the world with truth and grace and makes makes the nations prove the glories of his righteousness. Zechariah, the, 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 the text I just gave you, is all about how he's going to require the nations to worship him, and if they don't, they won't get any rain. In fact, the whole Christmas carol, Joy to the World, that is one of the most popular of all Christmas carols, isn't even about the nativity. Now, we make a couple of verses of it sound like it, and we think eh, nativity, but if you'll read the whole chorus, the whole song, it's not even about the nativity. It's about the second advent. Now, the second advent couldn't happen if he hadn't come the first time, so it's great. Go ahead and sing it. I love Joy to the World, but I also know what it's about. And at Christmas time, we don't just celebrate the beginning of Christ's ministry to save us we celebrate the whole enchilada the whole thing all the way through and you know what that's a great subject to bring up to folks who don't even think about it there is so much more to christmas than the average person even than the average christian thinks about that it's fun to talk about all that we're celebrating point being Christmas is about the whole story which shall never, never, never end. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the Christmas story. Help us to understand the whole of it and celebrate the whole of it, knowing that the story hasn't ended. We're living right in the middle of it. And we have so much more to look forward to. Help us to share your love with others with excitement and enthusiasm because of all that it means to us. In Jesus' name we pray.